I know I put something in there. It's this one I am worried about. No. Yes.
Hi, Jana, how are you doing? Hello, Professor. How's it going? I'm good, how are you? Peach, you came wonderful. Uh, Jenna, are you in the online lab? Uh, no, I'm in the in-person lab. You're in the in-person lab. You have nothing to worry about. Easy lab today. I know I've said that yeah. the last couple of weeks, but literally speaking, all you're doing is putting different amounts of the salt into a test tube, heating them up, getting them all to dissolve, and then letting them cool and recording the temperature that you see the crystals at. All okay. right. That's yeah, literally that's all you're doing and then you're making a graph. Yeah, that seems pretty simple. I think it's gonna be a lot better than previous <laughs> labs. Uh, yeah, and I have to apologize. Uh, I'm sorry, let me get Parker in here if Parker is. All right, no worries. Parker, you here? Yep, I'm here. Okay. Uh, I'm just sorry. I'm sorry. I'm talking about the uh, um, the online lab that's happening, or the face-to-face -face lab that's happening later this afternoon. Uh, Jana, I have to apologize, but I was just handed this stuff at the last second, and I'm literally scrambling to make this stuff work. So I apologize. Uh, same thing, Parker, with you. That is basically what's happening with the online lab. Have you looked at it yet, Parker? Uh, for which one? Colligative property. I have not looked at that one yet. I looked at the uh, the boiling point one, the other uh, one. The vapor pressure one should be fairly straightforward. All you're doing is you're looking at the survey to get the temperature of the boiling point, okay? And you have to realize the boiling point pressure is 760. Okay, Parker? Okay. All right, so you're gonna use the boiling point to identify the solvent in, there's a table there. And once you've identified the solvent, the heat of vaporization is there. Then the question for that part is, what pressure would be exerted at this new temperature? Plug all the values into the CC equation, you have them. Uh, the other part, you have a list of pressures, vapor pressures of water and temperatures. You have to change the vapor pressures into ln of P. You have to change the temperatures to one over, you got to change it to Kelvin, but it's one over the Kelvin temperature. So you have two lists, L and a P versus one over T. That will give you, a, you make a graph and the graph is then equal to, uh, is going to give you a slope. Slope times negative R will give you heat of vaporization. Simple enough, Parker? Uh, for the, the, so the first ones I'm looking at right now, so the, it goes vapor pressure and then it goes temperature and so you Kelvin. Do, you do the L, LN, each one of those pressures, you have to take the LN off. Okay. And then same thing with the temperatures, just with uh, one over. You got to change the temperatures to Kelvin, then it's one over the Kelvin temperature is equal to one over T, one over K. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, Parker. I'm not concerned about that one. I am concerned about the, the other one. The colligative properties one? I, I am not kidding you. It took me four hours, two hours the first day, two hours last night. I finished doing my presentation for this morning. I finished at a two in the morning this morning. It is painful. Anybody else that's out there that's in my online lab, the simulation is painful because it makes you get the exact correct answer. That means if you figure, if you don't look at the sig figs and you read something as 21.12 and you should have rounded it up to 21.13, you'll get marked wrong. And it will take you a while to figure out how, why that answer is wrong. I would strongly look at Dr. Liu's presentation. I would strongly look at my recording. 
Also, when you're doing the simulation, you have to read the instructions exactly. For instance, it tells you that you are supposed to put one cup into another cup. Then if you just scan through things, you'll see it's the next, the next major instruction tells you to put it on the, on the stirring uh, mechanism. But what you don't see is that it also tells you in the first directions, add the stir bar and add the top. If you don't do everything, it will not allow you to put the calorimeter on the stir thing. So you got to pay attention to the directions or you will get frustrated as crazy. Okay. Any other questions, guys? I'm here, uh, uh, office hours, 15 more minutes for office hours. So I do have a question for the discussions. For the discussions. Okay, gotcha, yeah. Parker. So because there's um like there's six, I mean you know, there's three different problems for that say June six. Uh yeah. do we have to respond to each like each no. one once or just any of them three times? You can like a total to, of three. You have to have a total of three responses. Okay. That, that, could that was be, it. I think if I'm not mistaken, Parker, I think I put out five problems okay i think i put out five problems you can respond to any three of those problems you can if somebody is on the regular student forum and they're asked what did mr popovich mean when he was talking about mechanisms the other day you can respond to their comment as well that counts it's any three responses okay anything anybody else has So we have a test on Tuesday. It will be in honor lock. I believe, do not hold me, do not hold me to this. I believe that, let me get out of this, go to stop share. Okay. That's not it. I think I'm in the right place now. Yes, I am. No, I don't want to be there for sure. Okay, I'm trying to look up your course to make sure of something. If not, I will make it available. Anybody has any questions, shout them out, guys. Okay. Are you seeing the screen right now? Yes. Okay. Do you see this very bottom thing here, honor lock practice quiz? Yeah. If you are not familiar with honor lock, I would strongly suggest that you take that. It's not going to take much time out of your life. I would strongly suggest you take that so because that will give you an idea of what's going to happen on Tuesday. Because Tuesday, you're going to go straight to test one that is not available yet. You're going to go straight to test one. You're going to click on it, and it's going to load the honor lock program directly into it. And there are some nuances, like you gotta have it, you have to have a computer with a camera. Guys, access it through Chrome. If you don't access it through Chrome, it goes through a fit. Uh, what else? There's going to be a bubble. It's a bl little blue screen with a white, like a cartoon bubble. That is a help chat line. I would suggest going there first because literally speaking, they're a lot more familiar with their software than I am. Plus I'm technically challenged. So 
I would go to them first. And if you're still having trouble, then that contact me. Araceli. Um, professor, since the test is going to be on, on Tuesday, does that mean we won't have class? Yes. Okay. So yes. will we have to take it during the hours of like class? Is it just going to be uh, open? I believe, I believe, Araceli, that I have, I have it from 8 a.m. to uh, 1 p.m.? One second. I can't believe I did what I did, but there is a periodic table there. Uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. No. Oh, yeah, that's fine. I have it to 1 p.m. Is anybody okay. need, does anybody need me to extend it? I have it starting at 8, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. I don't mind extending it. If you want it extended beyond 5 p.m., you got to come up with a real good reason, though. Is 5 p.m. reasonable, everybody? That sounds great. Yeah, that, that sounds fine. It's open note, right? Yes. OK, it is now for, from 8 AM to 5 PM. I don't believe I have a, yes, I do. I have a time limit, guys. The time limit is five hours. Dear God, if you want to be still taking this test, you start it at eight and you still are going strong at one o'clock, phone me. I will be happy to extend it for you, okay? But I can't imagine taking a test for five hours. I am going to stop share for right now. And I'm going to call up the test itself. Okay. Question one. Simple question. Simple two. Simple question. Question three. It is a hard question. It's going to require thinking. Question four. Simple question. Five, simple question. Six, simple question, but it's going to take you time to do it. Next question, something we've gone over in class. Next question, something we've gone over in class. Then we get into the thinking questions. I have 11 thinking questions. Of the 11 thinking questions, the last thinking question has zero points on it. The reason it has zero points on it is because you get to answer 10 of the 11, I'm sorry, excuse me. You get to answer all 11 questions if the last, if the last one will replace a wrong answer, if you get it right. So in other words, your best 10 of 11 count 50 points. The biggest problem, the biggest problem with these, with this particular test, for the colligative properties, there are five equations. Henry's law, which tells you what the, if you have the pressure above a gas, what the concentration of your, of your solutes in the liquid is. All right, that's Henry's law. You have boiling point elevation, freezing point depression. 
That tells you if you put something into a solution, how much you raise the boiling point or lower the freezing point. Remember, for freezing point depression, even though the change in temperature may be negative, when you go to apply it to that particular equation, change the negative to a positive because the KF is a positive number and the molality is a positive number. Just keep that in mind. Osmotic pressure, you have two solutions with the semi-permeable membrane in between them. What happens is the more dilute sample tries to get the other solution to be the same concentration. So the dilute sample adds water or adds liquid to the concentrated solution which increases the pressure in the concentrated solution. The last one is Raoult's law. And you will have a hard time understanding the difference between Raoult's law and Henry's law. Raoult's law says, you is measuring the difference in the pressures. You have a pressure when it is a pure solvent, then you add a solute to it, you get a new lowered pressure. Henry's law, you have a pressure, but that's related to the concentration of the solute. Henry's law, you are not trying to go from one pressure to another. Raoult's law, you are. So you got to know which equation you're using to be able to solve those. That is the biggest problem I've found. When, when doing, when grading these tests. Questions, guys. I'll go through some of this again. Are they um, are the are are there short answer and multiple choice? Yes. I have. I think I said about eight quest eight problem problems number problems. And there are 11, what I call thinking questions, which are multiple choice questions. We'll go through some of those, some of those type today. Because I don't think mechanism is going to take us the entire period. All right. Uh, eight number problems, 11 thinking questions, your best 10 answers. The last one does not have any points associated with it, but if you get that one right, it will replace one of your wrong answers. Fair enough, guys? Again, if you're not familiar with honor lock, please take the practice exam so you don't freak out on Tuesday. The exam is gonna be open from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. We do not have class that day. Okay, any questions? Does that go for lab as well? No, okay. we will have a lab. So, and I, yes, you are gonna have to come in next uh, Tuesday and I will be giving a, a lab talk. Guys, I had four people in the lab lecture today. It's your choice. Just remember, anything I say in that lab lecture, like I said that I wanted one hand-drawn graph and I wanted two Excel graphs for the graphing lab. Anything I say in there, I'm going to hold you responsible for. So if you don't attend the lecture, that's fine. I can't force you to do that. You at least need to look at the recording to see what I'm requiring. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Okay, are you seeing the slideshow? Somebody talk. No. no. 
I okay. don't see it. That's fine. I will get it up there soon enough. Now are you seeing it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Hands up. Put the hands up thing. How many of you are confused about this whole mechanism thing? Ethan, you can put, you can use the thing on the, you can use the device on the toolbar. You don't have to actually raise your hand. Uh, I, I'm just like, I'm just doing it because like, like partially confused, but like, I don't know. We're gonna we're gonna go to it. How about anything else? Anything else about this chapter? Is anybody confused about? Five people, four people raised their hands. Now it's down to three. If you have a, what else are you having problems with that I can try and adjust? The orders of the reactions. Okay, in terms of how to find them, Natalia, or in terms of what they are? Um, how to find them. How to find them. Okay. What you have to do with that is, uh, as soon as I find this silly thing, yeah. You have to look at your data, Natalia, okay? Do you see the chart I have in front of you? Yes, I do. All right, now what you're going to be doing is you're gonna be dividing one experiment's rate law versus the other. Okay, Natalia? And what you have to do is you have to change the concentration of one of your substances keep the other the same. So Natalia, in this experiment, which one is changed? Take two lines and you have to tell me which one is changing and which one is staying the same. Um, one in, wait, um, one in four. One in four, okay. What's staying the same? The C2O4. All right, that's staying the same. So this means that I'm going to be solving for the for the order of the compound that's changing its concentration. So in this case, Natalia, what I would do is I would put experiment one, my rate, I would plug in for the top there. That's equal to K times my concentration of HgCl2 raised to the M which would be 0 0.105 raised to the M times my oxalate concentration 0 0.105 raised to the M. I'm gonna divide that whole thing by experiment four. I put the load, the 1.8 times 10 to the fifth, I put nine times 10 to the minus six. That's equal to K times my concentration of HgCl2 changed. So that goes 0 0.0520 raised to the M. My oxalate stayed the same. So if I have one thing over another, K doesn't change because I haven't changed the temperature. So K goes away. Now, if I have the same number over the same number raised to the N, if I have two raised to the fifth power, over two raised to the fifth power. Don't those cancel out? Yes. So the second one cancels out as well. And what I end up having is 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth over nine times 10 to the minus sixth is equal to 0 0.105 raised to the M over 0 0.0520 raised to the M. I can rearrange that to have be 0 0.105 over 0 0.0520, both of them quantity raised to the M.
That is about two raised to the M. So that is, so my 7.2, I'm sorry, excuse me, nine, 1.8, negative five divided by nine EE negative five. That's 0.2. Mm -hmm. So I get, I'm sorry, that should be two. Two is equal to two raised to what power, Nat Natalia? To the M. Yeah. If I do this divided by this for my rate portion, that adds up to, that, multi, that divides out to two. 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth divided by nine times 10 to the minus six equals two. You got that, Natalia? Yes. 0.105 divided by 0 0.0520 equals two raised to the M. So two is equal to two raised to the M. What's the value of M? Isn't it one? One. So that's the so order. That would be the order of the reaction between those two. That would be the order with respect to mercuric chloride. Now you got to do the same thing all over again, only this time you're keeping the HGCl2 the same and changing mm -hmm. the C2O4. Okay. Solve it again, you get the order with respect to the oxalate. Now, the last thing you have to do, you found M, you found N. The last thing you have to do is find K. All you do is just pick one experiment. You know what the rate is. Mm -hmm. You know what this raised to what power is. You know what this raised to what power is. Solve for K at that instance. Okay. Okay. Yes, I got it now. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? That was a quick way to get through that particular problem, guys. Any other questions? Is there any chance you can go over um, one of the quiz questions on uh boiling point or i think it's boiling point or freezing point quiz questions what are we talking about we talking about the practice quiz i gave you no the quiz i was due this morning at 10. oh sure absolutely i can i can do that because you were asking for the molar weight okay let me i'm gonna stop here okay share screen Okay, quizzes, and that was quiz four, Manuel? Yes, the most recent one. Okay. I think it's quiz five. Quiz five? Yeah, right. I think so. Uh, this is quiz four. Yes, sorry, and then it's, it might've been quiz five, sorry. Okay, do you know what problem it was? Yeah, it was the one you had given, uh, it was like 115. Okay, this one was due today. Is that the one we're talking about, Manuel? Uh, five, five was due today. Are we talking about the yes. one that was due today? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, edit. Questions. Okay. That was a good question. Yup, the 115 grams of salt raised. Okay. Yeah. All right. So What, uh, uh, Manuel, what does it seem like the question is asking you for? Um, the to boiling, relate what to what? Boiling point elevation. Boiling point elevation. Oh, yeah. So that, so that form, that's, that is 90% of these problems. Okay. So the change in temperature is equal to KB times the molality, correct? KB times the molality. Do I give you KB? Yes. Do I give you the change in the temperature? 
Yes, by four degrees. So I got four is equal to KB times M. Four divided by 0.512 is equal to M. You with me so far, Miguel? Oh, I'm in. M. M is the molality, right? Co yes, correct. Okay, so 45 grams times. And oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. I, I had to include the Van Hoff factor. You. Okay, I'm sorry. I did not do that. So in actuality, four is equal to KB times M times I. Four divided by KB, which is 0 0.512, divided again by two is going to be equal to. Three point nine zero. That is the molality of my solution. Correct. Well, isn't the? I'm sorry. So, like, you take one hundred and fifteen grams of salt, which is NaCl, and then, or, or is that what we're solving for? Like, when when you said salt in the question, like, are we're not assuming this NaCl or it is NaCl? Uh, Annual. Any. Ionic compound is a salt. Okay. 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 Anyone. So that's Anyone. Where... Okay. Yeah. So you can't assume that when I say salt, that it means that it is NaCl. Okay. okay. Commonly, we know it is. But when we're in chemistry, a salt isn't necessarily NaCl. Okay. So you tell me how 3.90 is the molality. What's the molality equal to, Manuel? Is the molality? Um, I, I, I'm, I don't know. Uh, I'm not too sure. Okay. That's something you need to find out. Molality is moles. Oh, like what's the, oh yeah, moles per kilogram. I'm sorry. I Mo moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. Right? Okay. So I know that my molality is 3.90, and I know I have. 485 grams. Can I get the moles from that? 485, uh, yeah, moles of water, like convert it to moles no, no, of water. No, no, we no, don't, we don't need moles of water. We want the moles of our solute. Which we don't know, right? You're talking about 115 grams of salt. Yes. Okay. We don't know that. Okay. We can figure it out because we know the formula for molality and we know how much water. We know what the molality is and we know the, the amount of water that we have, correct? Yes. Hold on one second. Sorry, I'll let spam, I'll let the voicemail take it. So, Manuel. How are we going, if we know the molality is 3.90 and we know that we have 485 grams of water, how do we determine the moles of the solute? Well, I'm sorry, where did you get the 3.90 from? Because I had the, the boiling point elevation equation. The change, in the, the change in the boiling point is equal to KF, which is given in the problem, times the molality, times the Hoffman factor, which was two. So in the equation, you put the four, like, right, four degrees change, four degrees yep. Celsius on the left equals Hoffman's factor, which is two. We're solving for M and then the KB to be 0. 0.512, correct? Yes. Okay. So, so I do th did that math out and I solved the molality to be 3.90. Okay. All right. Now, do I know the amount of water I have? Yes. So if I know the amount of water, can I change that to kilograms? Mm -hmm. If I change it to kilograms, since molality is equal to mole solute over kilograms of solvent, can't I then multiply the kilograms of solvent by the molality to get the moles? Well, isn't it molality over kilograms? So it'd be the 3.90 that you said over no. 485. 
molality. D molality is equal to moles of solute over kilogram solvent. I know what the molality is, and I know what the kilograms of solvent are. So to solve for the moles of the solute, I multiply the kilograms of solvent times the molality. That will give me moles of solute. Okay, let me share this. Okay. I've got, let me see if I have grams and 115 grams of salt. Okay, all right, I'm going to stop share. If I put it out there, it may be a little better understood, Manuel. Sorry if I'm like the only one no. with this question. Oh, don't be sorry. Okay. All right, we solved KB or delta T is equal to KB times M. Ah, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Sorry, I didn't know if you were aware. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm constantly unaware. You see it now? Yes. Okay. So we're agreeing to that, correct? Manuel? Yes. So my delta T, my temperature rose five degrees. So that's what my delta T is. That's equal to 0.512 uh, centigrees per molality times my M times my Hoffman factor is two. Okay. Or divided by 0. 0.512 times two is equal to 3.90, which is equal to the molality, which is equal to moles solute, of, uh, moles of solute divided by kilograms solvent. Wait, I'm sorry, you said Four divided by 0. 0.512, right? Yes. And then you multiplied that by no, two? No, no, no. It's four divided by 0. 0.512 times two. I thought it was supposed to be divided by the two. Yeah, same. I thought it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. Oh. So why are you multiplying? That's because that's the denominator. Because well, we're trying to get like. M by itself. So it would be like you said, four divided by 0. 0.512. And then wouldn't it be divided by two again? Because the two is on the right side. Bear with me. That's what this means, okay? This is the same as this. Mm -hmm. So in effect, what I'm doing is I'm taking four div divided by, sorry, I need to get out of this. This is the same thing as saying four plastic. divided by one point zero two four, which is equal to three point nine zero. Okay, I have that. So what is that you said that three point nine zero is our molality? Correct. Okay, so molality. Okay, three. So then after this, what, what was it that you said we need to do? Okay, I have the molality. Okay. 3.90 molality is equal to moles solute divided by kilograms solvent. Right? Yep. 
I have 485 grams times one kilogram divided by 1000 grams equals 0.485 kilograms solvent. Okay. So I have 3.90 molal is equal to moles solute divided by 0.485 kilograms. Which or is 3.90 times 0.485 is going to be our moles solute. Okay, so moles of solute is obviously our X. So um, 0.485, which gives us 1.89. Now, I have one other bit of information. I have that the salt weighed 115 grams. So in order to get my, my molecular weight, my molecular weight, I've got to take my grams and divide it by my moles. So 115 grams represents 1.89 moles. So 115 divided by 1.89 equals 60.7. Okay. Okay, I got you. All right. Other questions, ladies and gentlemen? I hope that these couple of questions have been helping. If nobody else has a question, I have another question on that same quiz. I don't know if anybody okay. Else. Go ahead okay. And... Uh, let me get back to this. Okay. Next question, Manuel. Uh, uh, can you go down a little bit? I forget which one it was. Um, oh, these are the... Or is he, these are the answer. Oh, oh, uh, yeah. What is the boiling point of a liquid? Uh, no, which one was it? Hold on, let me look at it. I'm sorry. This question is a straight Clausius Clapion. Okay, yeah. I th I think you have that... the you have the heat of vaporization. You have that at 18 degrees Celsius, the pressure is 401. Basically, what you, you know that the boiling point occurs at 760 torr. So you have the pressure. At this point, you're solving for the temperature. So that's ln P2 over P1 equals Ea over R. No. That's not it. That's ln P1 over P2 is equal to negative heat of vaporization divided by R times one over T1 minus one over T2. And I, I know you've mentioned it in your lecture, but like the, you said the order of T1 and T2 don't matter as long as you're no, using- what I said was the order does matter. It does matter, okay. It does matter. You, you, they, they have to be in the right order. If you put P1 over P2, then one over T1 mi precedes minus one over T2. If you put P2 over P1, then it's one over T2 minus one over T1. I, gu I guess my question is like assigning values because that's always been like my struggle. Like Assigning values, what do you, what do you mean by that, man? As in if you give us two pressures and like one, uh, how is it? Um, if you give us, a pressure and a temperature, and we're solving for the pressure or the temperature, as long as we label the corresponding pressure. You're doing something like Boyle's law. If you have a, a gas at one atmosphere, so it's in a 15 liter cylinder. If you move that to a 30 liter cylinder, you're worried about associating the right pressure with the right volume. Is yes. that what the problem is? I think, yeah. Okay. Looking at this problem, Manuel, what pressure am I associating with 18 degrees Celsius? 401. Yeah, 
basically you have to look at the problem and analyze and you got to put those two parameters together. So I don't care if you want to call those P1 or P2. I don't want, I don't care if you call them the first trial or the second. You just have to know that whatever you put on top of the LN expression is the first one that is in your one over T expression. So, so then, gonna, go uh, ahead. I was gonna say for this question, so the P2, right? There is a P2, right? For this question that we need, that would be a standard, which is whatever standard is for. Uh, okay, you, to solve this problem, you have to know that at the boiling point, you are at atmospheric pressure. Okay. So if I say it's boiling, pressure is 760. 760, but that, that's not ATM, right? Or is that- That's tor. Or okay. that's tor equals millimeter, one tor equals one millimeter mercury. Direct okay. conversion. Okay. So in this case, P2 would be 760. Yes. Let me, let me stop this for a second. And let me go to the, uh, yes, end here. And I'm hoping I copied it. Okay. So the equation is LN. Let me see if I copied it first. Good. The equation is LN P1 divided by P2 equals negative heat of vaporization divided by R times one over T1 minus one over T2. Can I stop you right there? Go for it. Okay. So this is the same, like the same equation can be used as LN P2 over P1 equals negative H of vaporization over R, but we'd have to switch the T2, one over T2. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, perfect. It's manual. It's just a mathematical manipulation. Okay. They, both of them will get, lead you to the same answer. Okay. Okay. Right. So I put this in there. I got LN 760 over 401 is equal to negative. My heat of vaporization is 26, but R is in joules. Heat of vaporization is in kilojoules. So I've got to make this, I got to change one to the other. So I'm going to make this instead of 26. It's just easy enough for me to call that 26,000 joules per mole divided by 8.314 joules per mole C. That gets times, I gotta change my temperatures Kelvin. to Kelvin. I don't know what my first temperature is. Minus one over uh, 18 and 273 would be 291. And I'm going to limit this a second. Uh, so I can move you. Just so it makes a little more sense. I want it to be on the same line. All right, does this make sense to you? Manuel. Yeah. So I got the LN. Seven sixty divided by four hundred one. One point nine zero is equal to negative thirty one twenty. Wait to take the. Uh, I'm sorry to take the. And this might just be simple algebra that I'm missing, but to get rid of. LN on the left side, 
wouldn't it be right like to the e or, or do that yes or but in this case no no you don't have to do that all you got to do is put punch in ln in your calculator and then type in a positive 1.90 okay that will give you a real number okay okay if i was solving if if my variable manual if my variable if i had an ln of say 760 over x then I would have to raise both sides to the e power, okay? Well, because I put that in my calculator and I got 0.639 for ln 760 divided by 401. 0.642, okay, I can buy that. Minus, okay. Point zero zero three four four. Okay. So I have a negative three one two seven divided by T one minus. Ten point seven. Okay. Um. Okay. So wait, wait, where where did you get the ten point seven? Because it's if one divided. I multiplied. I I distributed this. I multiplied negative three one two seven by one over t one. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I multiplied uh, negative three one. That should be a positive. Sorry. Negative point a negative three one two seven times a negative point zero zero three four four gives you a positive ten point seven. Manuel, if yeah. I'm doing this, two times x plus four. Isn't that equal to 2x plus 8? No, yeah, I hear you. I, I, I guess just like the subtraction sign is kind of messing with me. Well, you've got a negative times a negative. Negative times a negative makes this a positive. Okay. All right, I subtract 10.7 from both sides. And I get 10.0. Ten point one is equal to negative. Uh, I'm sorry. This is a negative. Ten point one is equal to a negative three one two seven divided by t one. Negative ten point one t one is equal to a negative 3127. T1 is equal to negative 3127 divided by a negative 10.1. Professor, how did you get 10.1? I add at both sides, I subtracted 10.7 from both sides. Okay, Natalie, got it? Again, look at the way I have, I've caught myself a couple times dealing with the negatives and the positives. That's, a, that's another fallacy of this question. Okay.
Questions, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah, I mean, I didn't get that answer, but it's, it's fun. I'll figure it out. What, where, where are you different from me, Manuel? Oh, well, I guess like just on my paper, I, I'm not distributing. Like I'm, I'm waiting until, so like, for example, like one over the temperature, one over two, uh, 291. I don't know. I, I think I'm just doing the math differently. Like I'm, I'm getting a small number, like 3.4 times 10 to negative three. And then I'm dividing. You're, I'm sorry, you're getting what number? 3.44 times 10 to negative three. When I divide one, divided by 291. And then. No, 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 no. You're not. This is manual. This number is 3.44 times 10 to the minus three. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Are we good, Manuel? Yeah, we're good, we're good, we're fine. By the way, is that the right answer? I, I, I don't know, I, I got that wrong. Yeah, that's what I got. Okay, but is it the right answer? I think it says 38, but okay. I'm close to it. Close enough. It, it, it was 38 because I rounded it differently. When you are dealing with logs, if you if you if you round differently in logs, the number gets to be astronomical. It's kind of like earthquakes. A six on the Richter scale is much worse than a five on the Richter scale. So if you do a little bit of fudging, that really affects your final answer. But I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about the fudging. I want to see that you're manipulating the equation properly. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Because you. I, I really, I really want to thank you because you're asking questions that everybody needs to see. Okay. Finest kind. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Number three. <laughs> Okay. These are my possible choices. Now, when I do a rate law and I'm showing that the rate is directly related to the concentration of one of the reactants, then I have to use that as my first step. So if this is the only thing I have, then I have to start with it on the reactant side and it has to decompose into something. If I'm looking at all three of these others, okay, first of all, I can eliminate these two. I can eliminate those two because they're not in the rate law. If this one were in the rate law, then, K, then the rate would be equal to K times OCL minus squared. If this was in the rate law, then the K would be equal to OCL minus times the O3 concentration. So right off the bat, I can eliminate this one and this one. Now, part of my rules say that I must maintain 
numbers of atoms and charges. If I look at the bottom one, I have a negative charge on the reactant side. I have no charges on my product side. That doesn't fulfill one of my requirements. So I can't use this because the charges are unbalanced left and right. So the correct answer is the top one. Okay, Jordan? Yeah. Any other questions on that, ladies and gentlemen? Is um, the number, uh, question number one, you don't have the rate to find the order. So was that related to the slope? Yes. Okay, just wanted to make sure. You're, you, you're given time, you're given time and you have to convert this to LN of A, you got to, all mm -hmm. one of these have to be LN and you plot LN versus time, or rather you do the point method I, that I showed you. Yes. If the LN doesn't work, then you try the one over the concentration. Okay. And again, you're comparing slopes. So you would take 0 0.057 minus 0 0.096 over 81.09 minus zero. You would compare that to the slope of 0 0.0147 minus 0 0.0398 over 169.1 minus 117.1. Mm -hmm. You then compare these two slopes. If they're the same, then time is related directly to the concentration. If that's the case, then it is a zero order reaction. Okay, Natalie? Natalia, yes. rather? Natalia? Yes. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Um, can you go over number four? Sure. Okay, one, two, three. This one? No, it was the one, um, hang on. The one with the uh, two compounds. These two? Yes. Okay. Straight up. This one has an O attached to an H, right, Sarah? Mm -hmm. If it has an O attached to an H, what kind of intermolecular forces can that have? Um, hydrogen? Hydrogen bonding. Okay. okay, so this one has dispersion and hydrogen bonding possible. This one only has dispersion. So which one is going to be more tightly bonded to the other? Hexanol uh, or hexane? Hexanol. Hexanol will be more tightly bonded, which means it's going to have a bigger viscosity. Because viscosity okay. means the, the viscosity is the uh, reluctance for something to flow. Okay, because I put down that it was, um, that it does have a greater vis viscosity, um, but, but it was did? wrong. Okay. Yeah. All right, then you added the other answer. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's not really that much bigger. You got the same amount of carbons there. It's not really that much bigger. Oh, I see. All right. So that's why you got that problem wrong. It's because of the fact of the, the hydrogen bonds. The hydrogen bonding has much more of an effect than the slight difference in the, in the size of the two molecules. Okay, that makes sense. Anything else, guys? Professor, I'm, I have a question. I'm here, Araceli. Uh, number two, I didn't really quite understand that one because like, I don't know, it was kind of confusing. They're meant to make you think. <laughs> oh. Okay, this has to do with Arrhenius's equation. Okay, 
And Arrhenius' equation is the ln of the rate constant is equal to negative EA over R times one over T, right? So I've got the slope. The slope is equal to negative EA over R. You multiply the 2300 by R, you get the energy of activation. Clear enough? Yes. Anything else, guys? Anything else, ladies and gentlemen? Okay. Now let's get back to where I was supposed to start 45 minutes ago. Before I do that though, Athar. Yes. Jordan, I saw Vanessa. Vanessa? Yes. Thank you. Natalia, I saw Danny. Danny, Benita. Yeah. I'm rather garbled here, but I hear is a here. Sarah, I saw you. Gianna. Here. Jenna. Here. Jennifer. I'm here. Manuel, I saw. Parker, are you still here, Parker? Yeah, I'm here. Samantha. Araceli, I saw. Jessica. I'm here. Keanu. Keanu. Valeria. Here. Uh, Jenna, just saw. Leonardo. Here. Anaya, saw you earlier. You still here, Anaya? Yes. Anaya, it's been it's been more than a half an hour, and you haven't asked a question. I'm yeah, starting that's to get concerned. No, that's because they're doing it for me. Yeah. Okay, Natalie. I'm here. Thank you, Sachari. Here. Raylena. Raylena. Rhea? Yeah. Emily. Here. Delexis. Delexis. Okay. Now let's get let's get started back started with these mechanisms. Is everybody seeing the screen? The slideshow? Yes. Okay. All right. Now, we have to use the rate law as one of our steps because the rate law comes from the slowest step. So it has to be part of the mechanism. So I have to give you two things. I have to give you the rate law and I have to give you the overall reaction. So in my overall reaction here, I've got A going to 2B. So I've got to figure out how I'm going to go from A going to 2B using my rate law. Now, since the order with respect to A is 2, I have to have A plus A in one of my reactions. 
So A plus A, I gotta make something up. Guys, this is all a proposed mechanism. I'm not saying absolutely this is the way it goes. This is just a proposed mechanism. So what you do is you put, use the rate law to put your two reactants together. Then the best thing to do is to make up something and put one of your products there as well. Now, I'm looking at this step. I have to realize that I have to get rid of an AC because AC doesn't appear on the product side. I have to get rid of one of these A's because there's only one A that appears in the reactant side. So the simplest thing for me to do would be to add an AC I add another new compound to it. We'll call it D. So I'm going to have AC reacting with D to make a new compound AD. And what happened is it also formed B. So now I've got two Bs on my reactant side. I still have two A's on my reactant side, and I only need one of them. Professor, I have a question. Natalie. How'd you get, why add the C? Why add the C? Yeah. Okay. Are you saying, what are you saying to me, Natalie? What are you proposing I, I do well, instead? I mean, I don't, I don't know. That's why I'm asking, like, why this, why the C, like, it, is there like a, I guess to the rate law, you add the C, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> Do you see why I added the B, Natalie? No. I added the B because I got to eventually end up with Bs on the right side. Okay. Okay. So I added A and A together. A good idea for me to do is to add a B so I get at least one B on the product side because that's where I want to eventually go. Okay. Okay. Now I can't have A and A just making B because I'm dead in the water then. If it just makes B, I have nowhere else to go in the reaction. Okay, Natalie? Uh -huh. Okay. Let's say I just did this, right? I can't put B over here because I've just subtracted the B I just made. Okay. Does that make sense to you, Natalie? Yes. So I have to add something up here I have to add something up there with the B so I get something to react to my next thing to make another B. Okay. Does that make sense, Natalie? Yeah. All right. So when I'm doing this, I propose that my A and A made A, C, and B. Now, guys, does A, C appear in the product side? So I got to get rid of it, okay? One of the ways I could get rid of it is by reacting it with another compound, D. So I react AC with D, I make a new compound, AD, plus I now have a second B. Have I fulfilled my, my have I fulfilled my need for my overall reaction to have two Bs? Do I, have I created two Bs on my product side, ladies and gentlemen? 
Now, yeah. now let's take let's take a sense of what's going on so far. My ACs have canceled out. I've got one on the product side, one on the reactant side. So my ACs are canceled out. My Bs are supposed to be there. So right now I have a D on the reactant side I have to get rid of. And I have an AD on my product side I have to get rid of. Is there something else on the reactant side I need to get rid of? Is it one A? I need to get rid of one of the A's. So I can take my AD and react it to make an A, which is going to cancel out one of these A's. And this D is going to cancel out this D. My ADs cancel. So if I add my reactants up, and I subtract out my products from that. I've got two A's over on the left side. I've only got one A on the right side. So one A remains. AC cancels with AC. D cancels with D. AD cancels with AD. The only thing left on the right side are two B's. I could also have done this in another way. Something a little even more simpler than that. I could have had A plus A yields AC plus B. Then I could have simply said my AC reacts to make A plus B. Two A's on the left, one A. My overall reaction is A going to, my ACs cancel out. The only thing left on the reactant side is the A. Since my ACs canceled out and my A canceled, would that work as a mechanism for this reaction? I'm getting a whole lot of crickets here, guys. I don't, I don't see why not. It could work as well. So I've got, this is a good mechanism as well as this. Guys, you're making this crap up. Understand, you are making it up. All you're doing is trying to solve a puzzle. You're trying to develop a route that will take you from A plus A yielding something to A yielding 2B. And I know I have to have A plus A because the rate law is valid. Jan, do you have a question? It was just like in a sense of, would you basically give us the first step as to which way you would like us to yes and no Jana yes and no okay sometimes the rate law is not the first reaction all right let me give you an example of that if Okay, if your overall reaction is A plus C yields, no, so we're going to go two A yields B. That's the overall reaction. And your rate law is rate equals K Y 
right? So I know from my rate law that I have A plus C yielding something. I have to, because it's in the rate law. My overall reaction, A plus A yields B. Now, do I have C? Anywhere in this reaction, do I have C? No. So I have to create it, okay? I have to create it and I can create it by saying something as simple as A yields C. Okay? So this is an instance where I didn't give you the first step, I gave you like the second step. Okay, Jana? That, if you have something, if you have something in your rate law that doesn't exist in the overall reaction, then the simple reaction developed from the rate law is not the first step. Can't be. Because you, you have to get to C so that A can react with it. Does that make sense, Jana? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Other questions? Professor, you're muted. Sorry. I was trying to move, manipulate the, the uh, slides. OK. Let's look at this. I'm going to let's take a five minute. OK, guys, five minute break and I'll be right back. Okay, guys. Is anybody here? 
Crickets out there, guys? Somebody talk. Hey. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm just trying to see if everybody's back. Now, Jessica, look at the weight law and look at the overall reaction. Okay? Does my overall reaction have CL in it? Yes. Does it have CL by itself? CL2 no. is different. No, it doesn't. You know, it's different from CL. So when I put C3H3 plus CL, is that going to be the first step of my mechanism? Um, yes. Do I have CL? Do I have CL? No. Do I have to create CL? Yes. In order for, I have to create CL in order to make the overall reaction rate of mm -hmm. C3H8 plus CL. I have to make the CL. So this cannot be the first step. It'd be uh, C3H8, right? I'm sorry? It'd be, C3, it'd be C3H8. Yes. So, this is one of my reactions. It can actually be my last reaction. Doesn't have to be. I chose it to be that one. So, I have to create. I have to create CLs. Simplest way is I can take two CLs that's making a CL2 is making two CL minuses H3 H3 C3H8 is reacting to make that's not compound negative plus an H All right, so I've got my final product in there. Nope. Let's just don't ad lib Mr. Popovich. So I've got when I react my CO minus with my C3H8, I make H C3H7 plus HCl. I've got an extra Cl over here. I can react this with my CO minus to make my final product. My C3H7 cancels with my C3H7. I got two Cl minuses that cancels with this. So overall, I have Cl2 plus C3H8 reacting to make C3H7Cl plus HCl. This is something that you need practice to get good at. It makes more sense when I see it finalized. To be honest with you, I would rather you understand how I got the answer I got rather than you try and come up with something. <laughs> Last thing I got to talk about in kinetics, then we can go on for a test review. Last thing I need to talk about is something. I said there were three things that affected reaction rates. Anybody remember what the first two were? Okay. 
Benita, I'm sorry. By the way, Benita is very cute. Thanks. I can't hear you. Your 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 speaker's garbled. I don't know. I don't know what. Right now you're muted, but every time you've tried to speak, Benita, it's been garbled. Don't worry about it, Benita. Throwing the question out there, guys. One of the first things I said in the on the lecture in kinetics. That was the concentration rates are dependent on three things. Obviously, catalysts, because I'm going to talk about it in a second, are one. What are the other two? Temperature. Temperature's one. And concentration. Concentrations. Good. Now, the way the catalysts work, they reduce the activation energy of the reaction. If you reduce the amount of energy it takes to make the reaction go, you're gonna get it to go faster. The way that happens is it changes the mechanism that the process occurs. So if I'm going to Seattle and I'm going straight up to Georgia, taking a diagonal line from Georgia directly to Washington. I'm gonna get there a lot faster than if I decide to go via Maine. That's all I'm saying here. If you have a catalyst, there is a way that the reaction mechanism is changed such that the energy of activation gets lowered. If the energy gets lowered, you get it to happen faster. Has anybody done biology and does anybody know the mechanism for creating protons? Or, sorry, proteins. Uh, don't you need like RNA or? RNA. You're absolutely right, Sarah. You need RNA. And what the RNA does is it will attract an amino acid and kind of stick it on the RNA molecule. Now, the next site on the RNA will attract a, either the same amino acid or a different one. But it puts the amino acids side by side. And if they're side by side, they're going to link up. Eventually, when the protein has reached its termination point, it gets released by the RNA so the RNA can go and grab some more amino acids. What happens with the catalyst is it gets part, it's part of the mechanism, but it gets regenerated. So we're not using the catalyst up whenever we're doing this. Has anybody ever seen the elephant toothpaste experiment. Yeah. If you haven't, guys, uh, just type in, type in elephant toothpaste. You'll get a wonderful, wonderful experience there. Now, what you need to do to do elephant toothpaste is you need to have hydrogen peroxide, and you need potassium iodide. The overall reaction for this is H2O2 reacts to make water and O2. That's all the bubbles you're seeing. The Ki serves as a place for the peroxide to latch onto to separate it from the oxygen atom. In the process that happens, the Ki gets regenerated. So we've got a new way. Peroxide will, will just naturally evolve to evolve oxygen. The Ki just gives it a different way to make the oxygen. 
The different way it makes it lowers the energy of activation, which makes the reaction go faster. Enzymes are the same thing. Basically what happens with an enzyme in biological system, enzymes lock on to substrates. A substrate is nothing more than a, than a protein which is in the body. So the enzyme latches onto it. And when it latches onto it, it may decompose them into two separate products. The two separate products release from the enzyme, enzymes free, free to go and act on other substrates. So that ends the laboratory, uh, that ends the discussion on, that ends the discussion on enzymes. Okay, to relieve yourselves, and I know you're thinking a lot on this, I will not ask you for a mechanism on this test. I may ask you questions about mechanisms, like if I give you a rate law, is this a valid step in the mechanism? I, that is free game, but I will not out and out say, this is the rate law, this is the overall reaction. What is a mechanism? I will not ask you that question. Now, what I want to do, I've got about 50 minutes or so. I want to, I'm going to stop share now, and hopefully I'm going to be able to find thinking questions. Let's look at number four. Vapor pressure is higher at higher temperatures because at higher temperatures, some of the molecules have a higher kinetic energy and can overcome the intermolecular forces. The heat from the higher, from the, from the higher temperature causes the surface area to expand. Therefore, there are more molecules at the surface. Higher temperatures decrease the intermolecular forces of the gas molecules, thus decrease the density of the gas above the liquid. Higher temperatures do not result in higher vapor pressures. You got to think about what you know about intermolecular forces to come up with the correct answer. Anybody have a answer for me on this? I would say A. Okay, why, because, Joanna? Uh, because from because we know for a fact that when you heat up a molecule, it it, become, it turns into gas. Let's say it was liquid and it turns into gas. And from liquid to gas molecules do increase in kinetic Fair reason. energy and vibration. I so, would agree with you. Uh, the first half of the question. I would agree with you, Jana. Now, is D an absurd answer? Does that go against everything you know? Yes. Eliminate D. Question C, if you're decreasing the density of the gas above the liquid, doesn't that contradict the fact that the vapor pressure is higher at higher temperatures? So C is an absurd answer. B. I don't know how to explain why that this doesn't happen, but the surface area doesn't expand with heat.
at the triple point in a phase diagram. The ratio between the phases is three to one. The substance is three times more likely to sublimate than vaporize. The substance exists in all three phases. The substance is three times more likely to vaporize than sublimate. See. Did you say C, Benita? Yeah, I still can't hear. Absolutely correct. The triple point is where the it's that point in pressure and temperature where the substance is going to exist as a liquid, solid, and a gas. Consider the clausius clapeyron equation. How is the pressure increased? How is the pressure affected when the temperature increases? T2 is bigger than T1. Leonardo, I haven't heard from you lately. Leonardo? Yeah, the... Um... Okay, Leonardo. The pressure would increase as temperature increases. All right. You're right. But let's let's figure out why. If T2 is greater than T1, does that make the expression 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1 a positive or a negative number, Leonardo? A negative number. So I'm multiplying a negative number by a neg by the negative in front of the delta V vape. Is the right side of the equal sign going to be negative or positive? Positive. So what is the value of a log, either LN or LOG, that is positive? Uh, one. All right. Bigger than one. The ln of one is zero. So if, if a number is higher than zero, the log is going to be positive. So what that means is that if the log is positive, the number of the log, the number that you're taking the log of has to be bigger than one. If it's bigger than one, what is the relationship with P2 and B1? P2 would be greater. P2 would be greater than P1. When you, uh, yeah. When you freeze a gas into a solid, what is true? Are you releasing energy to the surroundings? And it's exothermic. Is it exothermic, but it has a positive sign because you're absorbing energy? Is it endothermic and has a negative sign because you're releasing energy to the surroundings? Or is it endothermic and has a positive sign because you're absorbing energy from the surroundings? Guys. From what you know, there are two answers that are absolutely absurd. Jennifer. Yes. What do you know about signs in exothermic and endothermic? I know that exothermic has to be a negative sign and endothermic has to be positive. So which two are you eliminating right away? Definitely B and C. B and C are gone. Okay, now you have to ask yourself the question. Does a gas have more energy or does a solid? Would a gas have more energy? Gas has more energy. You're turning the gas into the solid. So, so would it be A? Exothermic? Would it be A, exothermic negative sign? Yes. You have, A, A has more energy. Remember, we can't lose energy. 
So if it's a gas, it has more energy. If I'm turning that into a solid, that means I have a solid plus energy. The solid material, the material has lost energy. It's exothermic. That energy got released to the surroundings. Look at 10. Does the heat of vaporization change ever? By definition, heat of vaporization is the amount to take one mole of the, the energy to take one mole of the substance at standard conditions to a gas. So does it change ever? No. No, it doesn't. Heat of vaporization is not gonna change. Answer here is C. Read question 11. Just for question 10, so is it gonna be the same? Yep, it'll be the same. By definition, that's what heat of vaporization is. And that's why, that's why it's a constant. You know, we're, we're, when we're doing the Clausius clapion, we're changing the pressures all the time, right? Doesn't heat of vaporization stay the same? We don't change the heat of vaporization ever. It is what it is. Eleven. Which of these statements is true? These are not easy, guys. I'll grant you that. But the questions on the MCAT are not easy either. That's what I'm trying to train you to do. I'm trying to train you to think logically in a technical field. That's my goal here, guys. May I ask a question? Get out ahead, Anaya. Okay, so for can for Vanderwall, I kind of forgot what that was referring to, but isn't um when you say uh intermolecular force because of the charge because the charge is temporary and can switch from side to side isn't that when um an element is is positive and the other one's like negative and they and they like or like ionic bonds is that what that is no it's not ionic okay. bonds because ionic are permanent okay, ionic so bonds are permanent and each one of the ions has the charge. It has 100% of the charge. So oh, ionic yeah. bonds are even stronger than the intermolecular mm -hmm. forces in ion. Okay. There are, go ahead. C and D the false ones for 11. Okay. Let's talk about C, Ethan. Are dipole dipole interactions? Are dipole-dipole interactions uh, stronger than London? Uh, yes. So it's going to be, yeah. it's going to have a tendency to want to be attractive to each other, right? Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, then it's going to take a, is it going to take a higher temperature to melt it? 
Uh, yes, like because like it's like more energy to so break those. Does the statement say that dipole dipole will melt at a lower temperature? Mm -hmm. So is C a good answer? Y yes. Ethan. Or, well, and it, it says like which the statements are false. Oh, sorry, sorry. You're good. This that is why. This is why I need to have people around keeping me honest. You're correct. You are correct there. D okay. is D ice floats because of hydrogen bonding. Oh. So that is a true statement. It's the fact that in solids, the crystalline structure doesn't allow the molecules to get any closer than possible than the crystalline structure allows. When oh, wait, have, is the crystalline structure because of like the hydrogen bonds? No. No, there is a crystalline structure which has a specific intermolecular distance from one, hydro, one water to another. That distance is set. It's a solid. It has to be a rigid, has to be a rigid distance. Okay. On the other hand, water is free. It doesn't have the crystalline structure. So water is free to float. And as it floats, one water molecule gets closer to the other one. So water molecules can get closer to one another, having a bigger, a, a higher density than ice. So that's why ice floats. But there is another false statement here. A is false, right? A is definitely false. Van der Waals are the weakest intermolecular force. And that's because the reason it's the weakest is because the charges are temporary and can switch from side to side. Oh, wait, Van der Waals, just another name for like dispersion or London force. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Which of, the, which of the following is true? Xenon melts at a higher temperature than argon. Xenon has a higher density than argon. Xenon will freeze after argon does. Xenon vaporizes at a higher temperature than argon. Okay. Ask yourself this. If you need a higher temperature to melt something, does it have stronger intermolecular forces? Yes. Okay. If something has a higher density, does it have stronger intermolecular forces? By saying xenon will freeze after argon does, does that mean that which one, which one has stronger intermolecular forces? It freezes at a lower temperature. Which one has, which one will free, freezing Which one takes less energy to freeze? Something with stronger intermolecular forces or something with weaker intermolecular forces? Weaker. Weaker. So this seems to be a contradiction to the other two, does it not? Last one. Which one vapor? Which one takes more energy to vaporize? One with stronger intermolecular forces or one with weaker intermolecular forces? Stronger or weaker, guys? Somebody make a guess. Uh, well, with like stronger intermolecular forces will be harder to melt. Very good, Ethan. Stronger intermolecular forces, the molecules want to stay together. So I've got one 
that seems at odds with the other three. Now let's look at xenon and argon. If a molecule, if an atom is bigger, does it have more electron mass in it? Yes. If it has more electron mass, does that make the intermolecular forces stronger or weaker? Stronger. Stronger. So the fact that xenon melts at a higher temperature than argon, you need to have more energy to melt it. If you need to have more energy to melt it, it has a stronger intermolecular forces. That is true. If xenon has stronger intermolecular forces, it's going to have a higher density. Now, if xenon has higher intermolecular forces, they're already, they already want to be together. So it's going to take less energy. If it takes less energy, the freezing temperature is going to be higher than argons. So that's the one that is false. D is also true. Iodine has a triple point at point 0.118 atmospheres and 114 degrees Celsius. What is the most likely thing to occur if the iodine is increased from one atmosphere to 100 atmospheres at a temperature of 110 degrees? Remember what a phase diagram looks like. Let me see if I can get one up here. Didn't I have a phase diagram in here? Nope, that's not where I want to be. Okay. trying to remember where this was. Nope. There we go. All right, iodine. 0 0.188, 114 centigrade. One, I'm asking, I'm starting at one atmosphere and 110 degrees Celsius. I am below the triple point temperature. I am higher than the triple point pressure. So if I am higher than the triple point pressure and lower than the temperature, what phase am I going to be in? Solid. I'm going to be a solid. So not only am I already at a higher pressure, I'm increasing the pressure. And I don't recall if I said that I am. Uh, let's see. I am increasing the pressure, 
but I'm keeping the temperature the same. So what is happening to my iodine? Is my solid subliming into a gas? Is the solid melting? Nothing, the solid remains as a solid or the gas deposes into being a solid. I'm lower temperature than the triple point and I'm at a higher pressure than the triple point. So somebody said we started at a solid. I'm keeping the temperature the same, but increasing the pressure. What is happening to the state of my iodine? Nothing? Crickets, guys? Can Professor, I make it? Natalie, go you ahead. Said, you said you're in, increasing the temperature, but keeping no, no, it the I same? Am, the temperature is staying the same. I'm increasing the pressure. Increasing pressure. I'm already to the left of the triple point temperature. I'm not decreasing the pressure, so I can't be going from a solid to a gas. I'm increasing the pressure, so the solid is remaining a solid. Practice these problems, ladies and gentlemen. I've got some thinking problems listed out there. Araceli, question. So for this problem, well, we have like a, like a- um... Raph, no. Oh, okay. You just have to realize that unless, unless we're dealing with water, if you are below the temperature and above the pressure, you're in the solid area. If what I'm doing is just increasing the pressure, then I am staying a solid. What happens if I keep the pressure one atmosphere and decrease the temperature? Same thing. I'm in the solid quadrant. I am only decreasing the temperature. If I'm decreasing the temperature, it's going to stay a solid. Okay, I'm gonna throw it out there. You guys are pretty good earlier about asking problems. Basically, they were quiz related. Anybody having any problems with any number problems? Good, I can go take a shower and get on my way. Guys, this is your review. What are you having troubles with? Talk to me. If you don't have any questions, we're gonna just go ahead and end the session. As long as I go over like the, the extra practice problems that you have provided, do you think like I'll be well prepared for the test? Do as much practice as, on as many things as possible, Jordan. Okay. I mean, I can't answer that question. Okay. No. I um, can't professor. answer that question. Araceli. Uh, I don't remember, but did you say that we could use a textbook or notes? Everything is, everything is available to you. Okay. okay. You're allowed everything except okay. two exceptions. <laughs> You're not allowed to use another browser site. You're not allowed to use three things. You're not allowed to use a browser site. You're not allowed to use a uh, uh, cell phone. You're not allowed to have conversations with other people. Okay. I will listen to the conversations. 
If I hear so, anything chemistry related, anything chemistry related, I I have to pull your test. Okay, so when we do the camps, the room scanning, is it okay if we like have the textbook there, like you know, like yeah, like all the yeah. materials? Okay, I specifically put in there open book. Okay. Oh, uh, let me see. I'll uh, stop share. Share screen. What's this? Nope, that's not what I want. Stop share. Okay, we're going to go to quizzes. And test one. Nope, honor lock. Honor lock. All right, test one. Settings. Okay. I'm recording. I'm gonna record the screen as well. Any web traffic. Believe me, guys, if you try and get on the check, it records it. Uh, you need to have a photo and an ID. You need to do a room scan. Basically, this isn't clicked because you're allowed to use your own calculator. I figured you would rather use your own calculator than one I provide. Uh, you're allowed to, you're not allowed to copy and paste. And you're not allowed to print. So this would allow me if I wanted you to access a website that would allow me to do that. It's not allowing you to do it. Open book. Clearly marked. You're allowed to have previous notes. You're allowed scratch paper. You're allowed to go to the bathroom if you want. You're allowed your own calculator. Does anybody need to use their headphones? If that's the case, then you're not allowed to use headphones. I've never used headphones in a proctored exam. Okay, good. Thank you, Jessica. You're using them now though. Oh yeah. So guys, no headphones. I can't tell what you're doing, what information's going in there. You're allowed hats. You can take it in a public area. I wouldn't suggest it. And you're allowed background noise. So that's what I'm monitoring, guys. Again, if you have the practice exam, Again, go to quizzes. This is not monitored. Go down to practice exams at the very bottom. Click on honor lock practice exam. I would, it's not going to take you that long to take it. It will give you use to taking an honor lock exam. I highly suggest, if you haven't taken an honor lock exam, I highly suggest that you do take it. Any other questions, guys? I do have a question. It's regarding about the recordings of the Zoom meetings, because I've been trying to get access to the recordings, but I don't know where they are. Modules. OK. Go all the way down to the bottom. All right, these are my last summer meetings. OK, Natalia, those aren't the meetings that we have. If you go down, guys, I, since we are not using TechSmith as of at the end of the summer, I've just been recording them on YouTube. All you do, click on Zoom meetings 2021. Basically each one, I've got the subject matter, what we discussed, and uh, I've got a link. This will take you directly to the YouTube. That's how you find them. Okay, Natalia? 
Yes, thank you. Anything else, ladies and gentlemen? Are tests both multiple choice and the short answer? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's see, something else in modules. There are thinking questions and there are practice test problems. I just showed you what the thinking problems are like. This gives you an example of what I'm thinking about for these particular questions. As I said, don't worry about the mechanism problem. Can you hear me or no? Yes, I can. What happened, Benita? You're actually clear now. Well, my headphones were on and then I just took them off. Okay. Um, so for the test, um, are formulas given or do we need to know them? Uh, Vanita, it's open book. Okay, so just look for them. Okay. Yeah, basically, uh, I have a choice, Vanita. When I, when I normally give tests, I allow you to have a page of handwritten notes in face-to-face -face classes when I'm handing out the test, okay? Uh, in these classes, how am I going to really, if you've got papers on, dear God, look at my desk. Mm -hmm. All right. If you've got papers on your desk, how am I going to really determine what's on those papers, Benita? Mm -hmm. So it just made sense for me to just say, okay, it's open book. Okay. Thank you. Anything else, ladies and gentlemen? Um, I just have a question with the lab, but it can wait till like everyone else's questions are like done. Like I just don't want to interrupt the review. Okay, Jenna, is this uh, is this the online lab? Ah, uh, yes, the heat of vaporization one. Okay, good enough. I think you're on, Jenna. Okay, um, I just was doing it, and when I was plugging in like my values to my um, Excel graph, it was giving me a really, really, really small slope. And when I watched your um, review, Should your slope was a lot bigger. Yeah, exactly. Have That's you kind of why I'm really confused. Did you reverse the axes? It's, it, it, is it supposed to be um, time versus- um, No, it's not supposed to be time. Or one over time. One over temperature. Temperature, sorry. <laughs> it's ln of p is the y-axis. Mm -hmm. Okay. One over T the is the X axis. Okay. I'll try that because I was getting like a really, really weird answer. You should be getting, a, if you've got a very, very small answer that mm -hmm. way, when you reverse the axis, axes, you'll get a very, very large number. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Because it's the reciprocal of the slope you already calculated now. Got it. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Anything else, ladies and gentlemen? On that same review, can you do number nine? I think it's the one that's showing on there with the graph. Which one, this one? I believe so. Could you just like go over it real quick? Okay. Yeah. Okay. You've got a vapor. You got a vapor at 100 degrees. All right. I'm trying to take that vapor at 100 degrees to solid methanol. Okay. You need one more piece of information that's not provided here. And that information is you need the mass of the vapor. Okay. So that inadvertently did not get placed in here. At least I'm not seeing it. All right, Jennifer. Okay. So the way you solve it, you have to solve one problem going from the vapor at a hundred degrees 
to the boiling point of methanol. Whenever you have a curved line, the formula is energy is equal to MS or MC delta T. Okay? I've given you the C at the gas. M, say it's going to be 50, 50 grams times 44.06 grams per K times 100, I'm sorry, 64 minus 100. Okay, Jennifer? Okay, and you keep it in Celsius, correct? You can keep it in Celsius because what you're doing is you're finding a delta T. Anytime you're doing a delta T, you can leave it in Celsius. Because if you add the 273, you're going to subtract it in the next number. That's the first phase. Second phase, I'm going from a gas to a liquid. That involves another formula. And that is energy is equal to delta H vape, which is kilojoules per mole times the number of moles. So you're going to have to take that 50 grams, turn it into moles of methanol, and multiply it by the heat of vaporization. Now, here's a key, guys. If I'm going in the same direction, if I'm going from a gas all the way down to a solid, that is exothermic. <clears throat> because a gas has more energy than the solid does. If that's the case, the energy doesn't get destroyed. It gets given up to the atmosphere. So going from, it's easy enough going from the gas at 100 to gas at 64, <coughs> because the sign is going to be 64, your final temperature minus 100. That number is going to be negative. <coughs> so you know your energy is negative. The trouble is when you're going from a gas to a liquid, there's no sign, there's no change in temperature. So you just have to know that it going from a gas to a liquid is negative. If you don't want to memorize it, if you're going in the same direction, then the sign is going to be the same. Going from a gas to a solid, that is exothermic. The sign of all your energy values is going to be negative. Going from a solid up to a gas, that is endothermic. All of your values are going to be positive. So for this one, change your grams into moles. Multiply the moles by the heat of vaporization. Got another slanted line. That's going to be the energy is equal to mass times the heat of vape, the heat of heat constant for the liquid times the change in temperature. If my mass is 50, that's 50 grams times 81.08 per gram Kelvin times negative 97 minus 64. Another flat line. In this case, it's going from a liquid to a solid. So I'm going to use the heat of fusion times the moles of methanol. Then I'm going from minus 97 to a minus 120. Again, a slanted line. I use the equation mass times my C of the solid 
times the change in temperature, negative 120 minus a negative 97.7. Couple things about this problem that are wrong. This label should be grams per Kelvin, not mole. The other thing that's wrong is I did not provide the mass. Just assume it's 50 grams and solve it from there. Okay, Jennifer. Okay, thank you. Anything else, ladies and gentlemen? Okay, my voice is tired. You can tell because I'm coughing. So I will see six of you at lab today. Should be very simple. Of course, I've said that before. Should be very, very simple. All you got to do is measure out five things and take five measurements and you're done. Other than that, ladies and gentlemen, good luck to you on the test. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great one. You have a great weekend, Thank guys. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Have a good weekend. Three, two left. Emily, do you need something? Manuel, do you need something? I guess not. Stop share. And.